All right, let's begin. So the session is securing your data in Azure, tips and tricks by myself, Jeff Friends. Be sure to check out uh, everything that PASS has to offer. Um, yeah, especially I'm part of the uh, performance virtual group. And so there's been lots of great sessions and speakers. It's just one example of all the amazing things that PASS has to offer. So please uh, check out, check it out. Uh, your session evaluation is important. As I have different sessions, I like to get feedback on areas that you like, maybe some places where I should go deeper or um, related areas. So it helps me improve my sessions. So appreciate all the feedback. So who am I? I'm Jeff Renz. I'm a data and analytics architect. Uh, my background is I have a master's degree and bachelor's degree from Colorado School of Mines. I am in the Harvard Business Analytics program. We graduated in January 2021. This next year, uh, I did complete the Microsoft Professional Program in Big Data. And I have worked with uh, SQL Server and um, done a lot of BI projects over the past years. I have been consulting for eight plus years. And recently I joined the adjunct faculty uh, uh, through the University of Denver. So that's definitely been fun um, doing some online teaching. So this session's part of the uh, um, uh, pathway security and data management. Hopefully people have been able to watch William's session. Um, so what are we gonna talk about today? So we have Azure SQL fundamentals and best practices. Azure features that will help us secure the data. Um, again, just because we had SQL Server on premise um, doesn't mean some of those fundamentals go away. So we will talk about um, just a review of that and then uh, focus on a few extra Azure things, which are really nice. Overview of blob storage. So just what it is and uh, a few options when you're creating blob storage. Azure Key Vault. So that's where we could uh, focus on secrets where we could store passwords securely um, so that we have access to like, like databases and things like that, but you can't really see what the password is. Working with data, so common mistakes that users would, um, or developers really could do where you're exposing passwords, but you don't need to. And then data protection and Power BI. So fundamentals, we know that uh, on-premise or in Azure, we're gonna have users. We'll wanna create roles and put those users in the roles. We're gonna have schemas um, that would contain tables, views, and stored procedures. It is a best practice that you have that abstraction layer um, with views or stored procedures to get a data for end users. And then when you have your database, you still have SQL authentication for applications um, and for end users where possible, you would want to leverage active directory authentication. So what we have um, is a, a data warehousing so solution here where we have a bunch of different groupings of tables that we have. Um, and we're gonna say, hey, I have a business analyst and he's gonna to wanna, to, or she would wanna access data. So you could say, hey, in stage, you might call this schema, the ETL schema inside the data warehouse. This is a data vault structure. So we might have a DBR, a DBRAW, data vault raw. We'd have a business data vault. So data vault business. Then with uh, data marts, might store our fact and dimension tables in a DM schema. Could access cubes. So that could be a tabular schema. And then with 
reports, this might be the RPT schema. So for, uh, call it business analyst, would we want them to directly access the staging layer? That would probably be a no. For data vault raw, that would be a no. Data vault business, more than likely a no. The data bar be a yes. Tabular, let's say no, because it could access that data through the tabular model. An RPT schema, still say no, as uh, you would render reports to get at that data. So if we then say, okay, I have a bunch of business analysts. a role, I could then assign properties to the schemas via the role so that we're consistent and that um, you can leverage active directory groups to assign things to the role to grant proper permissions. So that, in my mind, um, is a good way to leverage um, what you have uh, as standard practices and there's no reason you can't do that in Azure. Okay, so those are our fundamentals. Um, security best practices. So when we're gonna create an Azure SQL database, we do have the capability um, to limit by IP address. So you could go in now and just say, I'm gonna open up the, uh, the database to the world, but that doesn't make sense. Um, you could change what port SQL's running over, um, and, and block inbound connections to port 1433 um, if you choose to. It's not always necessary that you really do that, but that you do have that option. Um, also, when, when you create the database, uh, you could decide, um, do I only want to allow Azure applications or resources uh, to connect to that database so that you could restrict uh, people connecting from their workstations, um, you know, laptops, et cetera. And then you do want to implement um, yeah, database security by role. So classic fixed roles are the DB reader and the DB writer. You could definitely make your own roles um, to make that work the way that you would like. So let's do a demo of uh, creating a SQL, Azure SQL database. Okay, so we're in the Azure portal. So if we wanted to create an Azure SQL database, we could click create a resource or Azure SQL databases. Let's click add. So we do have the option to select um, what subscription we wanna put it in. There's lots of different, I, in my case, I have a bunch of different subscriptions, but I'll go with the enterprise. You can uh, create or add different groups. So you can say, I'm just going to put this in the past demo. Um, so we can see this database name hasn't been taken. And then I could put it on the different servers. So I could put it on the LWJR server. Do I want to use Elastic Pool? No. Um, by default, you're going to get um, two cores, 32 gigs of storage. So if we configure the database, might say no. I'm used to my uh, less expensive ones. Maybe I'm in a dev database. I could do the basic, which is the 15, or no, actually five, or the standard would be 15. So I feel like I'm good with that. I could apply. I'm going to go next to the networking. Um, so you have options with uh, uh, adding private endpoints, etc. And I'm going to say I'm not going to create this database from an existing backup. Um, you could protect your data with the Azure um, SQL Defender, uh, which has uh, already been enabled on the selective server that I have. Then with tags, so I could say, hey, I'm going to do um, uh, environment. I'm going to say dev. Okay. 
view and create, then I can create that resource. So it's going to deploy that resource um, under my existing server. So what will appear uh, at some point is an additional database on the server. So you don't need to spin up a new server every time when you create and provision your Azure SQL database. Okay. So if we check, has that database been created? We're going to see, ah, yes, it has. So we could go back to the Azure portal and go to that resource. So now that the SQL database is set up, we could set the firewall. So we could see we have, um, different IP addresses that's allowed to access the server. And we're allowing other Azure services to access the server. So we can change that around if we choose to. Um, very easy to add another client IP if we wanted to by putting that in here. So another thing, if we look at settings and configure, um, we could see the performance level. We could definitely change that around if we want to. Um, we can look at what auditing um, set up. So you can uh, apply that if you choose to. So we could turn that on. And we could say we're going to add to storage, configure the storage, select the account we want. So we can say, let's create a new one. So what kind we want, hit OK. OK, so it's been created, so we hit OK. And then we hit save. There we go, we set up our auditing. Okay, so let's check out transparent data encryption. So we'll note without me actually selecting it, it did turn on transparent data encryption. So that's already set up uh, for the server. So I know that my data uh, is encrypted. So that was super easy to do. Okay, so that was fairly easy to do. Um, so with, with uh, Azure Database Security Best Practices, um, always encrypted is a good option um, as it uh, provides that separation between those that own the data and who could view it. Uh, row level security. So you can actually adjust in a table basis um, based on who's executing a query, what rows are returned um, with that. And then note, if you're not using database level encryption, um, you're definitely susceptible to attacks uh, um, that could compromise your data. So like we had uh, just demoed, you do want to enable database auditing. So you can, you can track your events that are happening and it uh, is gonna write that out to your Azure um, storage account. So you could view what's going on, looking for anomalies or anything that doesn't seem um, okay, suspicious. Um, auditing will also help you maintain your regulatory compliance um, and understand uh, database activity, not just for people trying to get into your database and do things that they shouldn't. Um, 
And then lastly, looking for discrepancies and anomalies that could uh, point to business concerns, maybe way more activity than you had uh, expected, um, or users that are trying to access stuff uh, that you don't expect. So you could investigate how much of that's going on, um, how frequently, et cetera. Also, you can enable uh, database threat protection. Um, there is a new security intelligence feature built into Azure SQL Database Services. And being a bit more specific, um, the Azure SQL Threat Detection does detect potential vulnerabilities um, in SQL injection attacks. And then, um, Anomalous database access patterns. So, upon receiving um, threat detection, email notifications can be sent, and users are able to navigate to view relevant audit records uh, through a link in the email. So, the link opens up uh, audit viewer um, or even a pre-configured uh, auditing Excel template that will show the relevant audit records around the time of the suspicious event. Um, according to the following, audit storage for the um, uh, database server with the activities, uh, relevant audit storage table was used at, at the time to write that event log. And then audit records of, that, um, of the hour immediately following the event occurrence. So audit records with a similar event ID at the time, um, some of the options for the detectors. So the SQL database threat detectors will use, a, uh, use one of the following detection methods. So there's a deterministic detection, which detects suspicious patterns, uh, rules-based uh, in the SQL client that match known attacks. Um, this method uh, has a high detection and low false positive, but limited coverage um, as it falls within the category of atomic detections. The other method, behavioral detection, uh, detects um, activity, which is uh, abnormal behavior in the database that had not seen during the most recent 30 days. So example of this uh, SQL uh, the client activity could be a spike of failed logins or queries, a high volume of data being extracted, um, or unfamiliar IP addresses um, used to access the database. So another best practice, uh, you can discover, classify, and label sensitive data in your databases uh, by enabling data discovery and classification. You can monitor access to your sensitive data in the Azure portal dashboard. I will demo in a little bit um, what it looks like to classify data and then um, uh, see uh, see what classify what it automatically could come up with and then if um, Azure doesn't detect things you could add some of the classification labels yourself okay so you do have Azure Active Directory uh, identity protection. So what is that? Um, it does provide an overview of uh, risk detections and potential vulnerabilities uh, with firewalls. It can detect real-time anomalies uh, using adaptive machine learning algorithms. Um, does generate reports and alerts so that you're aware and can investigate. And then it can automatically block and offer um, adaptive remediation. Do note that the Azure AD Identity Protection is an Azure Active Directory uh, Premium P2 Edition feature that uh, provides this overview of the risk and potential vulnerabilities. So the Azure Monitor Logs. Um, so you can see the security and audit dashboards and home screen for everything related. Um, to the security uh, monitor logging. 
does provide high level insight into the security state uh, of your computers, could view events for the past 24 hours, seven days, or whatever uh, custom time frame range you want. The uh, audit dashboard is organized into four major categories the security domains, so it lets you further explore your security records over time access malware assessments, update assessments, view network security identity and access information, view computers with security events, and quickly access uh, and quick access to the um, security dashboard. Another is notable issues, lets you quickly identify the number of active issues and the severity of the issues. Detections, um, lets you identify attack patterns by displaying security alerts. Uh, as they occur against your resources. Threat intelligence lets you identify attack patterns by displaying the total number of servers with outbound malicious IP traffic, malicious threat, and a map of IP locations. And then uh, common security queries. Um, lists the most common security queries that you can use to monitor your environment. When you select any query, the search pane opens and displays the results from that query. So the Azure Security Center uh, threat detection works by automatically collecting security information from the Azure resources and network and uh, connected partner solutions. Um, it analyzes the information, uh, correlating infra information from multiple sources to identify those threats. Security alerts are prioritized in the Security Center um, along with recommendations on how to remediate the threat So another look um, at what the security center dashboards look like. Uh, but again, the security center is working by automatically collecting all the security information from your resources, network, connected solutions um, to really go across all those different resources to detect are there threats. It's just not one instance, but really trying to um, look at all your resources as a whole. So a quick Azure security checklist, um, server level fire, uh, the server level firewall uh, is accessible from the portal. So you wanna make sure that the firewall seems appropriate for IP address ranges um, and appropriate access. You can also uh, access the database firewall rules uh, for Management Studio. Secure, uh, uh, secure connections to the database using secure connection strings. Good double check. Use access management policy. Turn on and use data encryption. Leverage database auditing. And then the SQL database threat detection. All these are uh, features to help you secure your data in Azure. All right, so I'm going to do a quick demo of some of those features. Okay, so what we're looking at is I have this HBAP database um, that's on my LWJR server. And I'm collecting some COVID data into this database. So I have COVID data, which is general, uh, but I could have some patients that have COVID. So what you're gonna see is two connections um, to the server, the all-powerful login, which is basically meaning I'm an administrator, and then I'm a lower level user. Um, so if we're looking at uh, like the patient table and I'm running data, I might have some sensitive data in this data table. So is there something that we can do um, to secure data a bit better and classify our data? So if we come into the Azure portal and we come to our HBAP database, we can come down to data discovery and classification. And if we look at what's in our database, um, we haven't classified anything yet as sensitive or uh, any classifications, but we have nine uh, found columns with classification recommendations. 
So if I click on this, I'm going to see, oh, look at this. I have a patient table where I have first name, last name, um, address, could be confidential, email confidential, patient social security, and password. And mm, password, this is interesting. Um, you can see it's saying information type, it's credentials, which is true. Uh, it looks like a login, um, social security, that would be uh, confidential GDPR. And I'll say last name. So I'm going to accept those recommendations. Um, email, put as confidential. Put phone. We don't want that getting out in address. So I'm going to take these recommendations and just say accept. And then you can change this around. So we could say address. Uh, contact information as a credentials, credit card banking, other, uh, et cetera. So we see last name's name, um, and we could change the sensitivity label that we have with this. Um, so I think we like, we'll just keep the settings that we have, and then we could hit save. So this is really nice, um, uh, nice feature that if we move stuff to the cloud and we have developers that are adding um, personal content, something that's confidential. Um, Azure can help discover those things and we can classify them even if uh, the, the developer or the team did not do that. So that's a really good feature. All right, so let's look at dynamic data masking. Um, we have some options here. Actually, let me go back really fast. Um, so in the classification, um, I'm gonna want to edit this. I'm just gonna remove these fast. I would like to do shade. Let's say uh, these aren't classified. Um, you can come in and view these under dynamic data masking. So if you note, know, if I've classified some of these columns, they weren't showing up. Uh, with the dynamic data masking. So one thing I can do, let's say I'm going to uh, hide email. I could uh, add a mask to that. Um, mask name with the default rule. So I could say, hey, I'm gonna set up my email to have, show the first letter and then just the extension for the email, the dot com. I can edit that. Uh, so we're going to see I have my masking rule for email, um, last name, come in here, I'll create this with the default value. social security number, then password. So let me hit save. Um, now let's see what happens. So if I come in, um, I'm an administrator. Nothing is going to change with the data that I see. When I'm a general user, I now see, I don't see the last name at all. Um, uh, the email's hidden, I don't see password or social security number. So I like that a lot. That's a good way to hide data on things that I shouldn't see. All right, but let's say um, I want to view the uh, last four digits of the social security number, not just X's. I could come in and change it from the default value of XXX um, to be custom padding, and let's say four. Hit update. And then hit save. Make sure in my admin, 
I run it, it looks good. I run it in here, so we'll see that. Um, or maybe I only want to show the first three digits. That's pretty easy too. So I concatenated those together. So that, that's, again, a very flexible, easy way um, to hide data from users so that I'm protecting and masking sensitive information. Okay, so moving on, um, Azure Blob Storage. So it's, uh, Microsoft's way to store um, any kind of information that you want in the cloud, kind of like a file system in my mind for blob storage. It's uh, a nice way, but it is uh, organized by you have your account and then you're going to create a container and put uh, uh, groupings of information that would make logical sense um, inside those containers. You could uh, take advantage of I am storing my pictures and my movies, which is obviously unstructured data in there. You could add structured data in there, um, common delimited files, JSON files, things like that. So there, there's not a restriction on that. Um, the, the kind of blobs that uh, you could create, so you could do block blobs, which store text and binary data up to 4.7 terabytes. Um, and the block blobs are made up of blocks of data that can be merged individually. So pen blobs are made up of block-like block blobs, but are optimized for uh, penned operations. So pending uh, blogs are ideal for scenarios like logging data from virtual machines. Page blobs uh, store random access files up to eight terabytes in size. Page blobs store virtual hard disks, VHDs, uh, files and serve as disks for Azure virtual machines. So ways to put data into blob storage. So you could use AZ copy, um, which is a command line tool for Windows that copies data to and from blob storage across containers or storage accounts. Um, Azure Data Factory. Uh, supports copying data to and from blob storage by uh, using account key, shared access signature, service principle, or other managed uh, identities for Azure resources. And then Azure Storage Explorer um, is a client side tool that um, I really like to use. I think it's really easy and it's a way to visualize what's, uh, what's in my containers, what's in my blobs. I could export um, or import files into it by dragging and dropping. For to me, that's the most convenient user method um, to put stuff and get stuff from blob storage. So blob storage. Okay, so when I bring up the Azure storage container, I have my different subscriptions and I have different storage accounts. So I do have my uh, COVID storage account, and then uh, I have a blob container, one that I created for Databricks. I can right click on blob containers, say create blob container. So call it data for, data for friends. Okay, and then I could, upload a file, I could select my files or folders. I'll just come in and say, hey, I have this uh, COVID US trend uh, file that I would want to put into blob storage. And I'm just going to hit upload. So we can see it's transferring the file. 
and then it exists. So it's uh, really easy. Um, something if you wanted to share externally is you could get this uh, copy URL. And so if you copy the URL, if I bring up Notepad, I'll just paste the URL in Notepad. So I could uh, email that out. And if I have pub public access granted um, to my friend or whoever wanted to look at the data, you could just come to the URL and download the data directly. Very friendly, super easy uh, user interface. So Azure Key Vault, it's a cloud service that helps you simplify the uh, um, process uh, providing a secure store for secrets and keys. So things like a password is what I would create as a secret. Um, it does act as a central storage location for everything that would be related to sensitive um, strings. Um, and you could also store your uh, SSL certificates there. So let's say um, you, you did want to create your certificate. Um, you can load it in there. Um, stuff like if you created a, a Azure Managed SQL instance, you could actually say, well, how am I going to encrypt my data? You could point it at Azure Key Vault, and that certificate would be used um, for your data encryption. Also note that uh, the authentication is done with uh, Azure Active Directory, and Microsoft does not see your data. So main, main areas to really help you visualize um, our secrets, which uh, Azure Key Vault um, secrets can be used to securely store tightly controlled access to tokens, passwords, certificates, API keys, and other secrets. Um, so from user management perspective, uh, Key Vault can be used um, to easily create and control encryption keys used to encrypt your data. Certificate management um, lets you very easily provision, manage, and deploy public and private uh, um, SSL certificates to use with Azure and other uh, internal uh, connected resources. So use cases, um, application development, database connection strings um, that could be saved in the, the web app, a logic app, .NET configurations, um, always encrypted uh, SQL, and protect sensitive data uh, by storing those uh, uh, encrypted keys in Azure Key Vault. And then you can use, um, with Azure Storage, uh, Key Vault can manage and rotate keys and again, the main thing is one place. You're keeping all your secrets um, so you know where it's at. So let's do a demo of Azure Key Vault. Okay, so inside the Azure portal, um, we can see you could create a Key Vault. So just does a quick, quick create. Put in pass demo. So my key vault name needs to be unique, but I'll call it key vault pass demo. Select the region. Put in West US2, pricing tier standard. You can create and create. Okay, so it's being deployed. Um, let's go back to an existing key vault. So I do have uh, key vault two. And if I come down to secrets, I do have um, two secrets in here. I have an account key access for Databricks and I have a COVID database password. So if I were to say, ooh, that's a database password, can I view it? Um, you're not going to see it. It's not there. So 
So the new key vault that I made, I could come into secrets, um, generate import secret, create a secret. So mine could be uh, a secret password. So I could put in one, two, three, four, five, six, not very secret. Um, but what's nice is I could set an activation date. So I could say, hey, this uh, the secret is going to start. I could push it out um, to maybe 1030. And then you could set an expiration date as well. So if you want somebody to have access to something for a limited amount of time, maybe uh, just a day, say I'm going to go out and change a, 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 when it's valid from in a period range. So that's a very nice feature. Hit create. So created the secret in my key vault. So that's uh, pretty easy and straightforward. Okay, there's one other way I could create a key vault. I could come into Cloud Shell. Okay. And what I'll just do is uh, I let it connect here. Do a Z. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is create Key Vault. So you have to know your subscription ID. Um, with this, and I'll just paste this in here. So what I'm saying is I'm creating a key vault. I'm gonna call it actually, um, let, me, uh, let me change this. I don't wanna recreate the key vault that I had. I'll call this uh, key vault three. Okay, and I'm gonna put it in the resource group. Um, uh, COVID resource group two with this uh, subscription ID. And that's it. That's the uh, command to create a key vault. So you could copy paste and add. Very easy to create additional key vaults. Okay. So it actually did provision it. Um, you'll want to keep track of the, the uh, key vault URI for future use. Um, but, but let's see what happened. So if I go to So we'll see uh, Key Vault 3, which I created. So it exists. I could add a secret to it if I want to. OK. So that's how you actually create your sequels, secrets in Azure. Um, next step would be I want to leverage that um, in an application. So let's go back to um, SQL Management Studio. What I have is um, a couple different things. Um, what I want is to connect to my Azure HBAP database. I want to um, log in uh, from my application using the password, which I did put in the uh, um, key vault that you couldn't see when I went in, but uh, it is there. Uh, and I want to do this again from a, a .NET application to connect to it. Um, also in my .NET application, I have a, I call it a localhost database that has um, ASP.NET identity tables. So how my application is going to work, I'm going to authorize access to my application using the ASP.NET database, using ASP.NET identity. Um, we could see that I have ASP.NET users. 
So with my ASP.NET users, um, passwords are hashed, so you can't really tell what it is. What I did want to note is for these different uh, email accounts, I actually have the same password, but using the ASP.NET identity, it's hashing to, uh, to different hashes. So there's older stuff that uh, same passwords will have the same hash. So this is uh, uh, very convenient. Another thing you can leverage is environment variables. So if I come in and edit my environment variables, let's click the environment variables button. So I'm gonna see a, a few different things. So I have um, Azure client ID, which is the, the key vault ID, um, the actual client secret that's created. It's calling uh, the COVID uh, key vault to, um, et cetera. So I'm leveraging environment variables. So coming into my .NET application, um, this is a Excel add-in. When I run this, um, the goal is to authenticate. Uh, after I authenticate, I'm going to um, view a form that will run a database query that will load that data into Excel. And so I want to log in and connect to the database um, that has the COVID data using the password from the key vault. So I'm going to run this uh, in debug mode. So this is actually creating this um, uh, rev gen tab. And so I'm going to log in to my ASP.NET database. So I have the JRENS2 login. I hit connect. A um, couple things should happen. So inside the code, um, I'm going to uh, Say I'm authenticated, but now uh, using the ASP.NET identity, I won't get into the details of the ASP.NET identity, but I did validate my username and passwords correct. Um, but now I'm gonna go to the data access layer and I'm gonna update my connection strings so that I could get data from the COVID database. So what we're going to see is a few things uh, in this method. So from the environment variables that I had shown, I'm specifically looking up that uh, the client ID for the key vault. So if I look at uh, values, the, the uh, COVID uh, key vault two is being used. Um, actually, I should step through this again, but it's uh, pulling all the different client IDs in the key vaults and then um, we're getting the key vault name, uh, the URI. So that's the key vault two. Um, so the secret name, if you remember what was in key vault, it's the COVID-19 Azure DB password. Um, and so the secret that's retrieved then, what is that password? So we could actually, we could see it's the uh, coronavirus is scary is that database password um, to connect to the COVID database. So we got that out of the key vault from the secret. So that's good as expected. Okay, so we're authenticated. I now have a COVID menu to go get data. Um, what this is doing uh, is an API call to the COVID tracking uh, API, and I'm getting back um, the different uh, uh, deaths, hospitalized, positive test results from that API, and then I'm just going to display that in the form. So those are cases. Um, if I go and say, I wanna get uh, the current data, 
So this is going to make the database call um, now that we have the database password uh, to return data. And it's actually querying um, this uh, um, table via a stored procedure. So if I click uh, get current data, So it's making a call to the stored procedure, select a uh, trend country by data, passing in uh, US as a country and I'm going back a full year. Um, and then I'm getting a data set back that uh, has this information of uh, total cases to return to Excel. So always good, uh, I think, from .NET site to leverage the stored procedures to get at your data. Okay. And so now I have current data going all the way back uh, to recent information as of a day ago. Okay. So let's say we wanted to um, leverage Key Vault, uh, but in Databricks, we're going to actually connect to our blob storage, storage using a Key Vault secret. Um, so here's the steps. N number one, you're going to create your storage account blob container. Uh, number two, create Key Vault and the secret, um, create Data Vault, or sorry, Databricks uh, workspace if you haven't already. Um, you're going to create a secret scope, and then you're going to mount to uh, blob storage. So what does that look like? So again, what we've uh, gone through before, you, you have your key vault container. You don't need to make one from scratch. Um, but when you come into it, you're going to go to your access uh, keys. Uh, and we'll just grab this and say, this is the key. Uh, you only get a couple keys. Um, if you change it and rotate it, you could have a lot of things that uh, might break. Um, so typically keys won't change if you're using Key Vault because you could create your secrets against the keys. But the idea is we're going to create a key, uh, a Key Vault secret from this key. Okay. Then we're going to come in and uh, create a storage container, which I've already done, uh, which is the blob for Databricks. So the next step is we're going to create the key vault and the secret. So we need to remember uh, the key vault URI and its resource ID. And you can see that just by simply clicking on the properties button um, uh, in the key vault. So then as before, uh, we're gonna create a secret, which I've already done. So it's the account key access for Databricks. Uh, with that key, and so you're not again not going to be able to see the key. We don't have act activation dates, so it's going to be uh, valid immediately and, and not expire. In Databricks, um, we won't do this because this could take a while. Uh, we're going to create our uh, uh, Databricks workspace. So we just hit the create, uh, put it on the Visual Studio subscription and the resource group uh, COVID RG2. Um, I have found that it seems to work best to keep your key vault, your Databricks workspace, and your blob storage where um, you're working with data all in the same resource group um, to get this to work correctly with Databricks. So something that uh, when you actually launch Databricks, you need to know the URL to connect to Databricks. Um, this is not a huge deal, but again, just note the full URL that you have uh, to Databricks, because when you're going to actually create um, the secret scope, you have to append that um, hashtag secrets create secret scope to the URL. So it looks like this. You just tack it on the end, and then you get this UI uh, to create the secret scope. And so you're going to have to fill in the Azure Key Vault, that uh, Key Vault resource ID, and then um, um, what you're going to call the scope inside of, in, uh, inside of Databricks. 
So we noted what our uh, key vault URI was. You can see that down here this is a COVID-2 um, with the subscriptions. Um, again, with the resource ID, we grab that uh, from the key vault. And then the scope name is past demo. Um, note, if you didn't do the dropdown for all users, uh, you could get this error uh, that it's, it needs to initially be created with the principal user. So just select that all users and it will create your secret for you. And you'll get the uh, secret scope um, has been added. So that's, that's pretty easy to do. All right, so now that we have that set up, uh, let's take a look with Databricks uh, on how to uh, connect to your blob storage con container uh, using the uh, secret. Okay, so I'm in Databricks. I have my Azure Key Vault demo. Um, oh, hold, hold on one moment, let me restart the cluster. So I restarted my cluster really fast. Um, so what you'll see is that um, if you were amounting um, to the blob storage and you're using a SAS token, this is what it would look like in Databricks that I'm going to my blob for Databricks, um, my extra configurations, um, and I would run that. Um, again, you could unmount. So um, using the, the secret in Azure Data Vault, um, you do need, again, to connect to your blob storage. We're gonna mount it as COVID. Um, we are putting in the secrets with the scope past demo, uh, which we created in the um, uh, UI by appending to the URL. And then we have that secret we created, uh, account key access uh, for Databricks uh, in the key vault. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, when we have that mapped, um, and it's mounted, it's true, uh, we could actually show the data. So let me uh, run it. And so this is uh, older data. I, I don't have current data, but uh, we have that there. Um, if I come into Storage Explorer and I look at uh, data for Databricks, um, I can update the data that I have. So update my COVID data, upload, whenever replace. Okay. And if I come back to Databricks, um, and let me uh, rerun. Let me rerun this. So I definitely have some uh, uh, different data that was loaded in the Databricks. Um, so we can three, see through uh, um, November. And actually, I have even more recent data. So if I do a save as and put it in here. CSV, hit save, okay, exit out. Okay, come back to File Explorer, Storage Explorer, load my files. I do this, load. 
Face all conflicts. Okay, come back and run one more time. So you can see I have recent data uh, as of yesterday. And then let me refresh this one more time. So, so now we can see some, some spikes and some information. So the data is definitely changing. So this is good. We're connected to lab storage, refreshing our notebook using a key vault secret. So working uh, with data and uh, common mistakes that we see. Um, so exposing connection strings, uh, SQL injections, so not using stored procedures, doing uh, dynamic SQL and code, not encrypting our data, and then unnecessarily unnecessary privileges. Like, yeah, everybody's uh, an essay role. We always know we should not do that, um, but it does make a difference. So let's get into uh, some common mistakes and some simple things you can do um, to correct that. So in the case of um, R, bring this up. Um, so we could see um, when we connect and work with data, uh, we could have some stuff with our connection strings where I, I put in the server, the user, uh, and then the password. So that's not really good. And it's not overly um, hard in R to, to take that out of your connection strings. So the better way is you could use the, your uh, R environment file uh, to, to save your connection string. And then if you share your R code, people won't see what that password is. So this uh, R environment file, which is found here, um, would say, okay, here's my user ID, here's my password, and here's my connection string. So that, that's very simple, uh, simple to do. Okay, so let's say we wanted to see what might happen in Python. Uh, so we have a COVID um, Python script. And so we have um, a bunch of uh, uh, connection details. So my database, my username, my password again, and the server is all exposed. I'm doing the uh, ODBC connect where I'm piecing these parts together. And then I'm selecting uh, star, which isn't good either, from a table not using a stored procedure. So not really good, um, especially with showing the password. So something um, easy that you could do is uh, if we look at our environment variables that we had set up, we can really just do the import OS and then we can set the username to get the COVID user, the password to get the password. Um, so, so that's uh, easy to run and, and get that information. Then the last topic is uh, data protection uh, and, and Power BI. Uh, so you could use Power BI to integrate um, information um, uh, where you can apply these things called sensitivity labels. So when I say preview, the data sets aren't in preview, but reports are. Um, so it's not 100% all functionality released. Um, but what you're gonna get is uh, enforcement of protected settings, uh, uh, encryption of water watermarks when you're exporting data from the uh, Power BI service to a file, uh, applying the sensitivity labels in. Uh, protections. So what's good about our sensitivity labels? Um, so they're customizable sensitivity labels. So you can create uh, categories of different levels of sensitivity, personal, public, general, confidential, highly confidential. Um, clear text, so sense of labels, clear text. It's uh, easy for users to understand and how you should be treating your content uh, based on sensitivity. 
And then uh, it's persistent. So after a sensitivity label has been applied to content, it goes with content when it's exported and you're gonna see that label, uh, especially in uh, things like PowerPoint where you wanna do that. So what that looks like when sensitivity labels are set up, um, you're gonna get, uh, um, is it a confidential internal, highly confidential internal um, when you go into the um, dashboard to do those reports. And then when you uh, export your report from Power BI, uh, it will say data is classified as confidential and is protected um, only for the uh, uh, internal users to edit uh, edit this label. So I hope uh, you found this information useful. Um, thoughts on things that are standard, um, a few extra Azure things to secure your data, thinking through um, how to take advantage of key key vault with your applications and developing them, uh, protecting your sensitive passwords and connection details, and then some interesting stuff uh, that you can do in Power BI if you go through uh, with the administration and set up uh, the sensitivity levels. So thank you and I appreciate any feedback that you have. Thanks.